we got more Tower of God content. And from Chibi, this one is called People Were Too Harsh on Tower of God Season 2's animation. And Episode 2 proves that. Guys, please go give Chibi a like. Sub to his channel if you haven't. Let's check out <laughs> what he has to say <laughs> regarding the animation of the Yun family I see right now. Trust me, dear viewer, this is definitely important for the plot of Tower of God. All jokes aside, my goodness, they uh, they yeah. they, they fully animated this, didn't they? Like, the ass is, scene. This is a wild sequence. Like, I'm not, I'm not even gonna lie. When I was watching this episode, I was just like, it was nice. Did an animator? It it was nice that they actually did show that, right? I mean, I I guess they didn't have to, but I it's that fan service is pretty tame though. Like, I I don't think this is egregious at all compared to some of the other shit I've seen. Really, just sit down and like animate this whole sequence for her. I'm just like, you know for a fact whoever did this, they, they are like, I Rumors. like this character, I understand yeah. the assignment, let's yeah. make this as detailed as possible. Legitimately, I I'm gonna be blunt, I would have to say in terms of sequences, this might be the best animated scene. <laughs> Even better than when Bam went up to fucking rate his Shinsu on the orb. Of all the animation sequences... All the budget went into this one scene, bro. Sequence of the episode. Like, I, I, like, there might be another scene, but, like, it is legitimately unreal just how well animated this sequence is in this episode of Tower of God. But, uh, with that being pushed aside for a second, Tower of God Season 2, man, it has been such a treat, honestly. It's been good. Like, pushing aside, obviously, the, uh, the posting of what I just showed there with the butt shot. I, I really am loving the pacing of season two. I was a little bit concerned that things would feel very fast paced, like trying to be rushed to get through this as quickly as possible. But it seems. Is Chibi telling me that he wants more meeting episodes like Tensura? Sometimes fast paced is not bad. Sometimes, honestly, I genuinely think this. Taking Classroom of the Elite example and Tensura example and comparing the complaints from the light novel readers and the anime audience and looking at the numbers. I genuinely think fast-paced shit where they cut out a bulk of the content in order to appease the normie audience with hype shit is better for an anime than doing something the opposite where a hardcore community will cry and say, oh my god, I can't believe they cut out everything, they rushed everything, this is such a garbage adaptation. Yet, Classroom of the Elite still stands on top. While Tensura is trying to do a one-to-one -one fucking direct, direct translation and how many people have dropped that shit and are upset at it. I don't know. I feel like... Y'all might have opinions, but I got fucking numbers. Seems like the animators that is working on this, the staff, the storyboarders, etc. They are properly pacing out the episode. Now, to be fair, it's been a long time since I first read this content within the webcomic. And so, I could be misremembering things, but in terms of adaptation, it honestly seems like they're doing a pretty damn good job. Like, I don't necessarily have any complaints. I think they're really getting across what needs to be getting across. I think the only complaint people might have is the different direction of the switching perspective of Tuwangnan instead of showing Blue Turtle, Rack, everyone else. Even people might be fucking missing Rachel, man. We saw a little bit of her. In fact, the moment she started monologuing and Bama's head, I started to get triggered. But that's probably the only complaint, which is not even like a significant complaint. It's just the direction of the story arc right now. In terms of like, let's say, foreshadowing, plot buildup, character interactions, etc. I think there has been enough time dedicated to really kind of get a good understanding of what's at least going on right now within the story. And one of the main central things that obviously the episode is wanting you to focus on is definitely this ring from Wagner. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. probably mispronouncing his name. I've never been able to... What the fuck did you just say? Definitely this ring from Wagner. I... I Wogman. Wogman. Wang Nan. It's so easy. Wang Nan. It's, it's not even like a language gap. These are very easy pronounceable things for English speaking audiences. Wang. Wang Nan. Is, that, is it hard? I, I'm probably mispronouncing his name. I've never been able to say it right, so please forgive me on that. But basically. He has this ring, and it's already been kind of showcased a few times already since episode one, you know, came out last week. And, you know, with the revelation we got with this episode, and then the last episode, and the information you can gather from season one, if it's fresh in your memory, if you rewatched or whatever, yep. you'll know that the symbol on this ring is, you know, Three the eyes. sign of Jihad. Like, it is literally, you know, the sign of someone that is, like, Zahad's at the eyes. top of the tower, the person that basically is, like, the king, so to speak. And, obviously, you know, with this 
episode revealing the main objective of like the organization called Fug and how like you know we see Kill Van here literally working with them. He's a Slayer candidate according to them. You know, apparently his objective is literally to get rid of candidate. I thought he was a Slayer. He's a candidate to become a Slayer. I don't think the anime told me that. That's like a minor spoiler. It's not a big deal. But did he say in, in episode two? Okay, okay. He's a candidate. So he's not a slayer just yet, and there's multiple candidates then? Oh shit. Multiple candidates for slay- We might even get to see them. And then what does a real slayer even look like? And their job is to take down the king. Maybe they don't exist yet. Huh. Interesting. ...of Zahad and just remove him, like, kill him. And it's just, uh, when you factor all of that in, it's just like... It's clear what's being set up here that Wagner is in a very dangerous Wagnan. situation because whatever this ring is obviously has a lot of significance. We just don't know necessarily what it fully means, but there definitely is something that we just don't fully understand yet because you have it to where Bam in this episode, he literally confronts him. He's like, huh, this is a fashion statement or whatever. I've never seen anything like this. And you got to imagine, you know, Bam has been literally like training underneath this shady organization potentially for years. And, you know... Yeah, I don't know how much time has passed, but is Fug that shady? You Han Sung Hwani? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a ter it's pretty much a terrorist organization if you think that the, you know, the right people in the tower are the king, but I, I don't, I feel like the Fug, I don't know, we need to see more members. If I just see Yu Han Sung and Hwari and I'm not really thinking evil. Obviously, thanks to that, he's gotten to probably learn a lot about the tower. It explains why his personality is just definitely a lot, you know, darker and how he just has lost his innocence. You know, he, he's definitely... I don't know about that part. The losing the innocence, while he has seen ruthlessness and he seems a lot more merciless, the way that he was willing to just kill in episode one. But at the end of episode two, the way that he rejected everyone, I came up with two possible outcomes, right? I said, either he really is that OD. He's just standing on business now. He's not a simp. He's a, just a Sigma Giga Chad ready to just call everybody that can't keep up with them. Or he's secretly hiding the innocence with this mask as a fug slayer and saying this shit because at the end of the day, he doesn't want other people to get hurt. I think it's the fucking latter. With the way that he's, you know, thinking about Rachel, there is some things about him that I think that the innocence is still there, but they're keeping it very obscured in ways of. Just like covering his eyes with the long bangs or making him seem all gloomy. I think something is still in there. We learned a lot. And so someone that is obviously meant to go after and get rid of basically the high-end king of the tower. Like, for instance, that's what, you know, Bam's objective is with this organization. You think he would know about trinkets and stuff for a fashion statement. But the fact that he doesn't makes the ring very suspicious. And it just, it's like, what's going on here? And even though it's clear that Bam drops it, he doesn't, like, dive into it too deeply, there is clear some suspicion there that something's mm -hmm. going on. So that is definitely what this episode tries to set up very early on. And it was definitely giving you a lot of indication there was something with this ring. And what pisses me off the most is the lack of reaction from Wang Nan's perspective. He never even thinks about whether or not he's Zahad. Obviously, because they don't want to disclose that yet. He has the ring, but nothing's really confirmed. The only the hard conclusions, I mean, the hard evidence is his name, right? Literally says, I am Prince, if you read it backwards. Or, you know, just the ring itself, right? But despite that, there's nothing that we can confirm on Wang Nan's side. Any of monologue, anything that suggests that he could be Zahad related other than the name and the ring. And I guess the author is trying to keep it obscure right now, right? But I thought that when Bam said, I'm here to kill the king and his family, Wang Nan is accounted in that. Yet, I don't think there was much of a reaction. But he was very secretive of the ring, right? He did try to keep the secret of the Zahad ring. And I guess that itself is enough to kind of go off base, thinking that, yeah, he probably is a prince, just we just need more details even in the first episode. And then you tack in, like, you know, the uh, the actual ending sequences and all that with the eyes and all that showcasing, like, the king's symbol, and then you see the ring, there's something going on there. But, okay, disregarding all that for now, let's back up for a second. I wonder if the king actually has three eyes, like... 
two eyes and like an awakened eye in the middle. And let's talk about the main content of the episode. So basically for the most part, this episode was uh, testing power levels, testing necessarily who is the strongest amongst the group in this testing on the 20th floor and who has the right to kind of move onward. And overall, these tests, as we know at this point, they're not as easy as like, oh, you know, you got to do so and so. There usually is a lot of intricate details that, you know, you got to figure out for yourself and really yeah like i guess like even the picking part there was a little bit of nuance because love didn't say love didn't specifically say that the number one rank will choose the seven he just said we're gonna pick the top eight that's gonna go in there and yeah this tower of god is basically a tower of tests every fucking thing every game test everything is just a sequence of tests analyze in this case the test giver here the ranker was like okay you know the first eight you know i want to judge and see how strong you are whoever's the number one you know it's implied that you know they would be the strongest there but the point of the matter was is whoever was the number one would get to choose the other seven people to follow them into the next part of the test and it, very clear from you know bam's reaction and how he's been he basically is like i don't want anyone to you know journey on with the test to me you know fail them all mm -hmm. etc and this is a nice little contrast to his character from the first season for sure i like the direction but i don't, th I don't think it's genuine i think he's still a boy acting as if he's a man i i think that the fuck slayer mentality is definitely there but i think that the innocent bomb is honestly hidden behind the fucking bangs if you cut those fucking bangs like straight up just give him season one haircut and he'll probably be fucking normal again like straight up just cut those fucking bangs off bro and then the innocent boy face will come out you've seen his eyes one thing i did notice was the voice acting the voice acting was definitely different from season one obviously there's been a time skip but Nah, I'm not believing this shit. The motherfucker's probably still simping for Rachel, making me hope that he's a Sigma Giga Chad when he's not. Basically showcasing that he is not about, you know, trying to drag everybody to the top of the tower with him, because that was kind of like his objective. FYI, as a reminder, in season one, at least before the final episode where Rachel shoved him off, <gasps> I can't believe Chibi was spoiled like that. He was basically a character that wanted to make sure everybody got to climb the tower together. He gave this hope that, you know, you don't necessarily need to mm. be like a, you know, like this vicious Hey, Serena, you can climb the tower with me, too. I'll figure out a way. Just individual that needs to shove everybody to the side to kind of work your way to the top. We can all get to the top together if we just join hands and help each other. It's obviously very stereotypical and good feeling, etc. But obviously, Bam as a character was a very naive individual. And a yep. lot of people knew that that was surrounding themselves around him in the first season. But they respected and loved his, you know, naive nature and his innocence. But with purity, Rachel shoving yes. him off the tower and, you know, people thinking he's dead etc and what has happened to him when he lost everything you know that innocence is now gone so he no longer seeks to potentially drag everybody up the tower with him because for one he doesn't want to hurt others but also he potentially doesn't want to get hurt as well you could definitely cut i think he doesn't want to hurt others part correlates to him cutting off the seven people saying you can't come with me because you probably can't keep up and you're gonna get hurt. I'm gonna draw an indication to that, that, you know, he does have feelings, he still cares a lot, but he just doesn't want to be hurt. Because, you gotta imagine, Rachel, what she did to him was very devastating. Yeah, that betrayal, he definitely has trust issues now. If he had, didn't before, he 100% has trust issues now. But even, like, the reluctance to get close to other people, it makes a lot of sense now. It was something that would honestly break apart most people, because as much as, like, People can sugarcoat it, say, get over it, it's been a few years or whatever. You know, he, his only person he knew in his entire life, his shining star in his life, was Rachel. And he, he literally was wanting to climb the tower to chase after her. He wanted to make sure she was okay, etc. And then he wanted to climb the tower with her. But then she betrays him at the last moment, shoves him off, and pretty much intended to kill him. And that just devastated his entire psyche. It's just like, someone that was a childhood friend, someone that was his closest friend, his only friend for a very long time. Not even just a friend, pretty much like your god. Your mom, your master. I see Bomb as a literal pet. He is a dog. Wagging his tail and panting, looking up to Rachel. Then Rachel just fucking kicked him off. Did that to him. And so making connections for him is definitely going to be very difficult. It, it's going to be something that's very hard for him. It's going to take a lot of time for him to be able to overcome that. And wanting to reach out a hand and be able to form a bond with someone. So I do like what this episode showcases. The progression of his character. As much as people want to quickly write off, let's say, Bam's character. And say that, you know, he's an edgelord now. And to be fair, to an extent, he is a little bit of an edgelord. Not going to lie. Yeah, 
Well, I don't think he's so tuny. He, he is. He does look very edgy, and I'm a big fan of it. I'm a big fan. The drip is magnificent. And another thing about the drip is like I even asked this question last episode, where I said, "Yo, how the fuck are you just gonna tell everybody that you're a fuck slayer, right? If you're gonna be a terrorist, shouldn't you be discreet about it?" But then again. He's literally wearing clothing that says, I'm a fug slayer. Not everyone's going to know, but the people that are going to be, you know, aware and scared of them, they are going to know that pattern. Like, love straight up saw it. So it's like, fug, the terrorist organization, they're here to flex. They are here to let people know a change is coming. Look at this slayer drip. You see this shit? I'm going to kill the king. It's just crazy how you can just do that in public. It's pretty much putting a target on your back, though, aren't you? But it's understandable. It's an understandable edge. It's not being an edge lord for the sake of being an edge lord. He was pushed into this because it's just like anyone in his situation would act like him. It's like they'd be selfish and shove everybody away just to be able to climb the said tower. But uh, getting back into the point, though, what I'm trying to get at is, is that he has to select multiple people to be able to journey up into the next test with him. He says no to everybody. And so the ranker in question is like, okay, then, you know, you don't want to follow the rules. You know, let me challenge you. You know, let's do a deal and all that. Like, if I win or something, you know, you'll have to select seven and follow the rules. If I lose, then obviously you get to take the test and the challenge alone. And so obviously Bam agrees to this. And because it's like, it's very clear from this episode, it's painting him to be incredibly powerful. And whatever training he's been put through thanks to his association with the organization Fug, he is definitely a lot more powerful than he was at the end of Season 1. Oh, yeah. His overall potential is definitely, we don't know exactly how high it goes, but at the same time, we gotta remember that the individual he is fighting is a ranker. He is fighting someone that is a test giver, and if anyone remembers just how powerful, ridiculously powerful they were... What was the score Viol got on the power test? I think it was 100k, right? Didn't Love get like 13 mil or like 1.3 mil? Right, 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 right. What, what did Love get? Was it 13 mil or was it like 1.3 mil? It's either 13. Okay, so it's like 10x. No, it's like, it's like 100x, right? 100k, 100K yeah, 1.3, 13 mil, yeah? So, so if we're just going off of the Shinsu gauge, I'm going to assume that Love is going to have some restrictions just like how Quants did during the test, but like beating this ranker right now, can we really? Then again, he is a fug slayer, right? This dude has been trained to be able to kill the king. Now, he's not a slayer yet, he's a candidate, but... Next episode is going to be very interesting to see how Bomb, right now, in this current moment, competes against a ranker in season one then it makes you wonder is he really at the level to be able to challenge someone like a ranker can he really beat a ranker and obviously it comes down to the test it comes down to whatever deal yeah. or whatever i'm sure there's going to be some gimmicks right every test is structured such that it's not just a brutal 1v1 raw strength fight there's these parameters in every one of these tests such that there's a lot of teamwork focus in it, involved in it too but it really makes it interesting and these gimmicks and scenarios where someone that perhaps shouldn't win could win because it's not just a 1v1 it's like a test for that you know the test giver gives bam but you know the end of the episode sets up for the fact that the test giver that is trying to challenge bam here legitimately doesn't like him at all he doesn't like organization fug or anything like that and basically everything implied with this little sequence is that you know he m might even try to kill bam and that's that's not gonna happen let's get real <laughs> If Bomb died, if Love killed Bomb, like, what is the purpose? Oh, Wang Nan's a new main character. All right, let's go with Wang Nan. People are gonna drop this show, bro. It's obviously very, very scary. So depending on whatever test he's given, could potentially cost his life. But uh, getting back into the main point, that's another thing. The episode of Tower of God, episode 2 of season 2, also sets up the fact that there is a struggle within the tower politically, to where mm. it's like you have a side that obviously wants to get rid of the current head honcho for- Yeah. And it seems like the proctors of these tests are more pro tower side, pro Zahat. Yu Hansung is a proctor, but there's obviously, you know, people that got into those positions and kind of are corrupted, but corrupted if you think that, you know, King Zahat's side is like the good people. So because they're test admins, I guess they're naturally just on the side of the tower because they want to maintain the status quo. I wonder what other people think. For instance, Zahad, and then you have, you know, those that want to remain in power and keep him in power. And so, obviously, most of the rankers that were probably put in position throughout the tower underneath, you know, Zahad's reign probably would want to keep him there. So, everything.
Wonder what the 10 great family thinks about this shit, right? Are the 10 great families happy that the Zahad is in power? If we, we could honestly, we, we could honestly think of this current structure in this world in like an emperor, like an, like an empire setting in like isekai shows or fantasy shows, right? Where basically in an empire, what's going on? You have the emperor who rules over all. And beneath the emperor, there's a bunch of great houses, which you could see as great families, right? There's these nobles. And most of the times, the emperor's greatest threat is not other, you know, empires or opponents like that. It's actually the nobles underneath because the faster that those nobles and great houses or great families can unite or become stronger, the more it makes the emperor scarce. So the emperor sometimes tries to call the people beneath him, the great houses, by paying off some different people. This happens a lot. This is a very common cliche because I guess this is basically history. Now, if you take that example and apply it to Tower of God, the 10 clans, would they want to work with Fug to take down Zahad, right? Who is really on Zahad's side? Why would they stay with Zahad? I'm sure, like, like the Zahad princess, you know, formula too, are people really happy that Zahad's just taking their daughters and just injecting them with blood and like treating them, they're like brand name fucking luxury products? I don't know. If anything, I'd feel like the 10 great clans, if we just follow common tropes and cliches in different shows regarding empires, they should be core in taking down Zahad, right? The thing about this is, it's like Bam is really challenging the system of the tower. He's literally going against the main forces of the tower. So it makes you wonder, how far is he really going to go? And is Fug necessarily a good organization? Is it actually an organization that's just, you know, you know, demonized and it's actually not necessarily a bad organization? Or is it I truly think... a bad organization? I think good and bad is so relative, right? Who determines what is evil, what is good? The winners of war, those people write history and create a standard of reference where you are now the good people, but if the other opposition won, then it would be the complete opposite. So we haven't seen King Zahad yet, right? We haven't seen other Fug members other than Yuhan Sung and Hua Lian. I, I need to know more to understand what is the king all about? Is he really that bad of a person? and Bam is in over his head, and he's really, uh, he, you know, he's probably going to go down a very dark path. Whatever may happen, though, obviously this episode sets it up, and I'm really excited to see where it's going to go. Yes, but, oh, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed my You know what to do. Please go give Chibi a like or sub to the video if you haven't. And I am really digging this whole new setup of, like, Bam is a slayer candidate. He's here to actually kill the king and his entire family. And now the world building is just expanding even more. We get more introduction to other great families and I don't know, maybe a coalition where we unite the 10 great families or at least get some of their help that wants to band and revolt against Zahad and teaming up with Fug is the way to do it. But do we even want to do it? Does Bomb even want to do it? He's just doing this because he's getting manipulated by Yuhan Sung to climb the tower for the sake of, you know, getting his answers. But at the end of the day, I don't think Bomb necessarily, like, he says that he's going to kill them, but does he truly believe it? Like, deep inside, I wonder if he doesn't care about any of this, and he's using this opportunity to meet up with his old friend and live the old life, just like in, you know, season one, we're just hanging out in the cafeteria and just having fun, right? I, maybe that innocent bomb is still within there, or maybe he's completely changed. I don't know. I'm more likely to believe that the innocent side is there, just beneath the bangs that's fucking clouding the rest of his face.